All right, and welcome to uh, the session about how we run the couple websites with 110 million hits. Um, great to have you all here. Um, my name, I'm the guy on the right side, I'm Michael, or people probably call me as Schnitzel, I'm the CTO of the Amazing Group. And today I want to talk about a project or multiple projects that actually have to do with the IO and the Amazing Labs at the same time. So. I'm wearing a bit two hats, but I want to show you um, a bit what we've done. This is not going to be a standard session. We are at the end of bad camp. Let's do a bit more collaborative. If you have a question, please stop me immediately. The whole session is maybe only 20 minutes long, but last time I did it, we went into very deep questions, and I want to do that again. So if you have a question, if you want to know more, stop me, and we can go deeper. And there is not a lot of slides. There's a lot of diagrams that we're going to look at because today should really be about, I want to show you how we do it, because I really truly believe we don't do that enough, especially from a hosting point of view. So everything you see is exactly what we do, and it's pretty much our heart open. So enjoy, and please ask questions. So as said, we have multiple sites, and we're going to look at two different ones um, that I can give you a bit background of what we do. The first one is for the company Ringe Axel Springer. They are a media company and they have many different uh, websites. Right now they have 12 different sites that they run. They used to be a lot of different Drupal versions. Some were WordPress, some were Type 3, some were custom built, whatever. And it grew over top of their head. And they came to us and said, hey, we need help. So we started in the end of 2016 and we decided that we want to do a system where we have multiple front ends and one single back end. Because one of the interesting things is in media, or at least what we see, is that editors, they don't write for one publication anymore, they just write articles. And then these articles get published into different publications. And so for that they wanted to have the single back end. They want that, an, that a person that is responsible for the content can go into the back end and say I want to publish to that, to that side, to that side, to that side. They want to have cross articles and things like that. They want to use the idea of create ones, publish everywhere. And we thought a lot about how do we do that. And we ended up in having multiple decoupled front ends and one Drupal backend. So let's look at, the, at them. Um, we have a website that is called, they're all German. So you can do your German skills today a bit. Um, well, they have other, other languages as well, but I'm going to show you the German ones. The first one is called beobachte.ch. It's a consumer watchdog. The other one is Bilanz und Handelszeitung. They are like the Bloomberg's a bit of Switzerland, so they publish information about financial data. And then we have something completely different, gomio.ch, which is the Swiss website of the gomio. So they publish all the uh, chefs, they have gomio points, which one earned the new one. So look at them a bit. So the first one is that one, it's very red. Um, and you can see that here we have and teaser that has a picture, they have some kind of um, tag, and they have a title. And then if you look at the other one, this one has a picture, they have a tag, they have a title, and they have a subtitle. So we already see they are similar but different. And now it's one Drupal backend. And as mentioned, they are completely decoupled. So if we look at the network tab here, and I click on one of them, you can see the load bar on top that was, that was shown, and we can see one single GraphQL request that was done um, to the backend. Let me actually go. So we can see it sent a, a GraphQL request that it wants some kind of information um, to our GraphQL endpoint, and the data that comes back is a JSON array that is then parsed by React. And the same also for the first site. If I go in here and I run the network tab here, I click on one, again, GraphQL request to the backend. And the really cool stuff is, if I now go back to the start page, because the start page has been rendered once, I can go to the start page without one single request. And I can go back to that page again without one single request, because the browser now starts caching that stuff. Um, then we have the next site. Here we can see it's, it's again very similar. We have a title, a picture, and tag, and a subtitle. 
And if we go to the Gumio, here it looks again completely different. We have big imagery. We have um, we have all kind of new things. Like suddenly with colored backgrounds, um, they look these they look very different. Sometimes they even have Instagrams. They have videos in there, so it's very different. And so, but that allows them to have every single publication on the front end can look exact, completely different, but they have one back end. Um, and that's what we built with them. Another project that we did after that, that is also decoupled, is for the Swiss Paraplegic Center. So um, if you are paraplegic, they help you uh, learn how to live your life again and how to learn, like, because you have to relearn everything that you ever knew in terms of like body movement. And um, here we only have a single front end and a Drupal back end. But um, we can shortly look at that one. Um, here we have very big videos that are loaded um, with like endless special scrolling stuff, things like that. And that's again, that's super easy to be implemented with a decoupled system because all the tools, how they work, all of that is already there. And you just have to use the React stuff in that term. But again, here it's, um, if I go back and I click, let's say, on solidarity, we see that it. Um, that it loads, if I go back to the start page, it's immediately loaded there and I'm back. Okay, that's the two sites and I'm gonna reference some of them throughout the presentation, what we have done, how it works, things like that. And what I wanna do, I wanna talk about multiple topics. First of all, I wanna show you the infrastructure. So everything from the servers, from the local lens, and all that stuff that we run. The second, we're gonna talk a bit about the platform, how do we deploy, how our sites started and stopped. Then we're gonna talk a bit how do we work with code, especially because with decoupled sites, there's always questions, okay, do we have monorepos, multi-repos, or whatever. And then an important part is about people. We have sites that are business critical to the companies. They make their money. If the Ring of Springer sites are down, they don't have any advertisement money. And that's what they measure on every day. So it's business critical for them. So we need some process. And the last thing, I'm gonna show you some of the learnings that we had, anecdotes, things that we never thought about, we need gonna think about. Okay, first of all about the infrastructure. For the Ring Oxford Springer project, it's run in their own AWS account. They actually have a contract with AWS that gives them lower prices. And, um, but technically, our infrastructure can be pretty much be anywhere. Um, we don't have a dependency um, on um, where we run. Just these examples, we ended up in AWS because the client wanted it. Important is they are completely auto-scaled, and we're going to see that later a bit. So we can scale on container level, we can scale on VM level, we can even scale um, further. Plus, we use a multi-availability zone system. Means if one of the availability zone goes down at AWS, we are still back up. We have three of them, minimum, sometimes maybe even more. So let's look at it. So this is the whole infrastructure that we have running. Um, we see horizontally the orange. These are the different availability zones. And you can already see from patterns, we have pretty much everything is three times. But let's start from the very top. So over here, we have the internet. These are the people that all of us visiting the site. The first thing that hits is an AWS local answer. Uh, the local answer is high available in itself. It's not shown highly available or with multiple because in itself, it's just something we, we request and every single request goes through that. Um, that then sends that to these OpenShift routers. These are nothing else than um, HA proxies that um, know about every single page. So they know which site is running in which containers. That's basically the brain of the local answers. We have three of them in each availability zone. So again, if one of them goes down, they are still there. And then we have the, um, the Kubernetes masters. So again, in each of them, we have a master. The master are responsible for all of the orchestration system. They decide where does the container go, which server is overloaded. If we do maintenance, things like that, we shut them down, think all of that stuff. So they know what is happening, they orchestrate. Yes? Um, so the first thing I notice is no reverse proxy. Is that? We are not on that level right now. Oh, cool. So there, is, there are some re uh, reverse proxies, and we're going to see them later. That's more on like a VM level because everything is containerized and the reverse proxy is gonna be in a single container. We're gonna see that. 
Okay, so these like are pretty much the um, the nodes or the compute nodes or the, the EC2 instances that are with overhead, they are there to manage. Now we actually go into the compute nodes. So the compute nodes are the nodes where the containers are actually running. That's the, these are the beefy ones, 16 cores, 6 gigabytes RAM, whatever. They are the ones that actually handle the containers. The cool thing is we can spin them up and down as much as we want. We can add new ones on automatically, it will add new ones, it can remove them, and then the masters on top here will realize, oh, there's a new compute node, and will automatically put containers there, and things like that. We have in each of the availability zones, we have multiple of them, because, again, we need to expect that any of the whole lines, they go down, or it's completely gone for any second. So we always need to make sure that we have enough resources everywhere. So this is pretty much like the standard Kubernetes cluster you will find, you have some kind of router or ingress controller, there's different names of it. You have a masters that make everything, um, they organize everything, and then you have the compute nodes. Yes? Can you speak about the masters thing? That's just ETCD of Kubernetes. So basically, this setup is pretty standard to Kubernetes, where you have masters in multiple AZs instead of kind of a single one. And Correct. Workers in multiple spaces. Correct, yes. So, what, what is the benefit of that versus having a single master? So, if you have a single master and that master is restarted or stuff, your containers will still continue to work. Um, so, the containers on the compute nodes, they're still there, the routers will still work, but you cannot deploy anymore. You cannot create new containers, spin up new containers. You're basically just stuck with the situation that you had last time. Um, the multi-master gives you, that means if one of the masters goes down, the other one takes over automatically. There's no, um, they, um, yeah, they synchronize each other all the time. So will a master from one AZ control nodes from the yes. other AZ? One yes, that there is no control. difference across them. Okay. They don't know that they are in different ACs. Okay. They, they always synchronize each other. There is, even the OpenShift routers, they actually send traffic over here as well. They send traffic over here as well. Mm -hmm. So from a, log from a logical level, they're all in the same. They're all in one VPC. They always talk to each other across availability zone boundaries. Um, yeah. Plus, also at one level, if you do a lot of stuff in Kubernetes, then you get a lot of API calls to the masters. So you need at one point you need to spread it out over multiple because just the amount of requests to the API get too much for one single node. But that's something you just set it up. You say multi-master yes, and then it automatically does the synchronization. Yeah. I'm curious what the OpenShift router is for, if you're configuring your load balancer with your ingress controller. Yes. So the load balancer is very dumb. The load balancer knows just the IP addresses of the OpenShift routers. Okay. So every single URL that you create in the Kubernetes cluster, they end up on here and not on actually on the AWS Elastic load balancer, because that one is only a TCP load balancer. Well, they have ALBs now. Yes. You could include in that, but the other thing is we do the SSL offloading here, and the ALBs with SSL offloading is just not something that anybody has built yet. So we right now, these are NLBs, and they just do TCP load balancing, that's all they do, and the, the actual logic of the load balancing happens in the OpenShift routers. They do SSL, they, do, um, they decide where the traffic actually goes, and that, that stuff. Okay. Now we have some more. We need files. Drupal has a files directory that you want to have synchronized. And for that, we have a cluster. Um, a cluster of a system. Again, we have three cluster nodes in each of the availability zones. And they keep all our files on hand. These can be Drupal files, the regular stuff. In that case, we actually see we have an EFS for that. But we have like MariaDB containers that need files. We have Solar. We have Elasticsearch. We have persistent Redis, anything that needs persistent files goes into the clusterFS. The clusterFS um, is automatically mounted by the masters, so the masters know if one of the sites requests some storage, it will automatically attach it, it will talk to it, and all that stuff. So it's completely transparent. You don't have to actually go to cluster and configure it. It's done fully automated. Each of them have an AWS EBS SSDs where they actually store the files and they synchronize it all the time. Yes. So is cluster a separate level of layer from Kubernetes? It's not Kubernetes? Correct. Right now it is. Um, right now we set up clusters um, as separate EC2 instances. And Kubernetes has 
has support for ClusterFS as the API, but it's not managing the ClusterFS server. That is changing, though. And you have now container native storage where you run the cluster itself inside these compute nodes and then the, everything is managed in there. We're not there yet um, because just cluster is it's a bit hard to maintain sometimes and also the, just the, op the upstream, the open source is not there yet. But it's slowly, slowly getting there that we have the cluster in there as well. Have you considered other options for this shared file system underlying besides cluster? Yes, a lot. Um, the problem is we need, because we cannot only solely depend on AWS stuff. And so cluster as right now is a system that we can run in pretty much every data center. So we can run it at AWS, we can run it at Google, we can run it at Azure, we can run it on bare metal, we can run it on OpenStack. Wherever we end up with, with servers, we can run it. So we have the same system everywhere. But um, there is definitely discussion of like maybe sometimes directly mounting EBS volumes without cluster, if you don't need the high availability, stuff like that. So that's a bit of changing stuff. One of the special things we do, we also need, so because MS and EFS is very good in just files handling, um, and so all the Drupal files, so the pictures, the JavaScript, all that stuff that is uploaded into the files directory is actually saved at EFS. And we do that just because it's cheaper, it's easier, um, but we only put Drupal files in there. We would never run a database and so on EFS because it's way too slow. And then we need to back up the whole thing. We want to have a backup of every single um, persistent storage. We want to have a backup of every single database backup. And so they, we have some kind of backup system that currently we're um, refactoring. We're moving from Burp to Rastic. At the end, it doesn't matter. We just back up everything into um, either in one availability zone or sometimes even offsite. So that's in a bit of customization. Depends on the client, what they need, what they want, things like that. But everything is completely backed up. So we can go back multiple days to find files that have been deleted, notes that have been deleted, whatever there may be. OK. So this is pretty much what we run on an infrastructure level. As mentioned, it's Kubernetes under, underlining. We use OpenShift on top of it because of the higher security. And what OpenShift, for example, does, it enforces none of the containers is running as root, which is usually the case in Kubernetes. So um, we need that this is handled. Um, plus, it brings some nice things like the router itself is already coming with OpenShift. We don't have to deploy our, our ingress controllers and things like that. It's already coming with it. But at the end, what we work with every day is just Kubernetes, the APIs, that stuff. Okay. Let's go into the platform. As mentioned, it's completely Dockerized. There is pretty much nothing anymore that is not running in a Docker container. Um, if there is something, something went wrong. Um, the idea is to run everything in there. And the platform itself is, as mentioned, is Kubernetes with OpenShift on top. And Lagoon, our OpenShift build deploy system, is ma managing the deployments and all that stuff. And as I said, it's fully auto-scaled. <coughs> so let's actually look at the Drupal. You mentioned before, where's the reverse proxy? There we come. We start again at the internet. Um, we have the AWS ELB, and we have the OpenShift router um, that does the SSL offloading, but also knows the request to, let's say, www.beobachter.ch, and which container, because there's thousands of containers running, which of them, maybe one, maybe multiple, should actually handle that. That's what the router does. Now, we have different flavors. In this case, um, we have, um, we talk about the standard availability first, and then we can go over to the high availability and we see a bit of difference. So the first thing is we have a varnish. That is just a single one. Um, it's a varnish pod with a varnish container inside. The varnish does the regular varnish stuff, reverse proxying, things like that. Then the varnish sends the traffic to multiple Nginx um, pods. So in Kubernetes, a pod can run multiple containers. Most of the time, it's just one pod, one container. In the Nginx and PHP, because they talk so much together, um, we want to make sure that they always stay together. That's you put them both in one single pod. So we have Nginx PHP pods, which run the Nginx container and the PHP. That's where the Drupal actually lives. These where the files are, that's where all the stuff happens. And that is auto-scaled. So Kubernetes um, brings auto-scaling with it. 
And you can tell it, um, monitor, for example, the CPU usage of that single part. So it will start one single part, and it will monitor the CPU usage. If the CPU usage goes above a specific level, it will start the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one. And if the CPU level goes down a specific level, then it automatically shuts them again. And that happens fully automatically. So that's something that we don't even see. We can look at it, we have monitoring on top of it, but it's not something that we actively see, oh, that side needs more traffic, we start more of something. That's fully automated. And, um, and Kubernetes itself looks then which of the node has space and that stuff. If all the nodes are full, because they are at one point, we actually start additional nodes. So what we saw before here, let's say we have by default, we have three nodes in each availability zone. If Kubernetes realizes I now have so much traffic that I cannot place pods anymore because if each of the containers are full, it starts automatically, it will talk to the AWS API and start new, new servers on demand. And it will also do the other way around, it will stop and remove them automatically. So basically what happens, every morning we start additional servers and in the evening we shut them down because they are very, um, very volatile systems because people usually look at all the sites we saw throughout the day, but not in the evening and um, things like that. So the whole system is like breathing. It's, it's, act, it's adding and removing, adding and removing based on, on need. And so with that, we can obviously save a lot of money. So for that pod yeah. outer scaling, you're just using the built-in horizontal pod outer scaling? Correct. Yes. It's currently based on CPU usage. I'm not too happy about that because it's a bit slow. And also, depending on the Drupal side, the CPU usage is not the best explanation. What would be much better is if we could actually go based on how many PHP FBM pools are running inside the PHP container or how many connections the Nginx has. There is now a new, I think, Kubernetes 11 now has custom um, um, monitoring. And so what we want to do is put Prometheus on top of it that manages how many pools or looks at how many pools are running, puts it somewhere, and Kubernetes then automatically sees it based on that. Because right now it's a guessing game, and each site sometimes have different settings. Because you maybe have Drupal sites that are super fast, and other ones do just single requests that make huge amount of CPU requests, so that's a bit where we want to play with. But right now we found a good level of CPU. The other super cool thing is if we actually look at the routers on top, even before. So when the requests come in, based on how many requests per second we currently have, we scale. Because right now it's a, a system that is a bit behind. It takes two or three minutes for a traffic spike till we actually realize that it happens. So if you have a crazy, crazy amount of traffic spike, like from zero to five, six hundred requests per second, the containers, it's not fast enough. Yeah. With these how long uh, are you also scaling the ingress resources with these uh, along with the bulk cluster or we never we could we could we never had to. Mm -hmm. the, I mean the HR proxy in there is super fast and they are actually the EC2 instances which are running the HA proxies, they do only that. So they are very highly over provisioned and to handle spikes because but we could technically scale them and add them to the ELB automatically. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's continue, let's go further down. Um, down here, it actually looks quite easy. We have a MariaDB pod with a MariaDB container inside. We have a Redis pod with a Redis container inside. We have a solar pod with a solar, solar container inside. Nothing special, they automatically um, talk to them. So if we have 12 different Nginx running, they all talk to the same database, they all talk to the same Redis and things like that. One special one, which is built by Lagoon, is the CLI service. So the question is always, um, for Drupal, where do we run Drush? Where do we run SQL things? Where do we run all that stuff? We said we don't want to run Drush in the actual production containers. Because if somebody is able to hack these containers, they have access to Drush, and they do all kind of weird stuff. They install modules, they install them. And if you look at uh, Drupal Gaddon 2, for example, it was all about taking over the server, not hacking your website. They wanted access to the compute power. And so um, what we said is we create a special CLI pod that runs over here in a special um, system. And you can ac access it via, um, we have an SSH server that automatically allows you to connect 
into the CLI port. We don't have SSH running the CLI, it's just running on top here, and that then creates an automatically um, Kubernetes remote shell con connection into the CLI. And in the CLI, you have all the good stuff in terms of Drush, Composer, um, some other shell tools, you have even additional stuff you have. Sometimes we need, uh, we need some nodes running there and whatever. And that pod is actually only running when you need it. If you don't need it, the system sees that nobody is connected to it and automatically shuts it down. So um, it knows in real time if somebody is there. If it's not needed, it shuts it down. So um, with that, we have, a, we, have, we have the possibility to get shell access and all that stuff, but we also have the security because all the risky stuff of like Drush and all that things, we don't have exposed to the internet at all. Nobody will ever make an HTTP request to that system here. Yeah? How do you scale the database? We'll get there. <laughs> okay, let's go over to the high availability system. So within um, Lagoon, um, standard availability and high availability is only on container level. The infrastructure that we saw before is exactly the same. It's just either running multiple parts or not. And so what happens here is now we have, ev of everything, we have at least two. So that means we have two varnish parts. They are in parallel, so if a request comes in, the OpenShift router sends it to one of them, and they both um, request. And then the same system happens here, so we have an auto scaling on the Nginxes. It's the same system, we just run by default, we run two, instead of the standard availability, we run only one, but that's pretty much the, the, the difference. And then we go a bit into the, the harder stuff. So for MariaDB, we actually run a MariaDB Galera cluster inside containers. That means we have three MariaDB containers, that are automatically synced. It's not a master-slave, it's a master-master replication. It means any of these containers, they can do write and read. And so that means if we need an additional one, we can just start more of these. Um, or we can, we can shut them down um, if we need to. So that's really nice because we can now, in real time, scale the database up and down in performance. If we need more, we just add more of these. The questions will automatically be distributed across all of them, and uh, we have more database power. And we can also scale down. It was never really necessary so far, but would be possible if needed. Yes? Uh, yeah, so um, is there a benefit in uh, not using the read replicas instead of master master? <laughs> yes, so read replicas are good for performance, are bad or for high availability. If your master dies in the read replica, you need some system that realizes first that your master is gone, and second, needs to promote some of the slaves to a master. That's a process that can take seconds, minutes, depends on your system. Here, because we never have a slave, they're always masters, you don't have the problem. So that's, that's why we use Galera and not masters, uh, like read, write replicas, things like that. It's just, it's a much easier system. Do you think that slowing down the actual replication and kind of being able to do from writes if writes end up in the of the mills and the mills have to be in sync before the write can happen? So how Galera itself handles that, it's pretty cool that it actually allows you to do the write um, before the other ones have acknowledged it. So there is like some cool stuff that they do. Um, I can tell you more the problems in it. And um, yes, it is technically a, type, a slight slower than just running a regular master slave because you have always three that need to do it. But we see the advantage of having in a Galera that any of them can die, especially in a container situation. I would not run a, a read-write replicas in, in a container environment because any of these containers can literally die any second. So we should see the advantages uh, of the performance um, there. Plus, we obviously also have Redis, where a lot of the writes go anyway, like caching and all that stuff. Can you speak at the order of magnitude how much cheaper this would be compared to using RDS or Aurora? It depends. Um, the question is, if you run, I mean, or I can probably talk about RDS in general. If we have RDS, if the infrastructure provides us RDS, we're using it. So that system is like, again, the default. If we, ha if we don't have any database, managed database, we are gonna build that. If we have an existing system and we like it and it works, like in AWS with RDS, most of the time we actually use RDS. 
And then we have another system, which is a service broker, where when you create a new environment, it automatically talks to RDS, it creates a new database, a user, and, and, and exposes them as environment variables. Um, but I can't tell you what is cheaper and what not. The good thing is with RDS, obviously, you only have maybe one database cluster running, and then you multiple sites connect to that. Here in the Galera system, every site runs its own Galera cluster. You can do the mix again. You could run one Galera cluster in your con in your cluster, one only, and use the service broker with that. Like there, it's a lot of different possibilities. For us, it really depends on what is needed. How much traffic does the site really need? But the default is running it in the containers because it's easier. Okay. Now. Um, where am I? <coughs> okay, now let's look at the decoupled. It's actually very easy. The only difference is we have on Drupal side, we have exactly the same. <coughs> we have Varnish, Nginx's databases. The only new thing that we add on top of it is over here, is now we run Node.js as well. So the decoupledness just needs Node.js. We have multiple pods, they run Node.js containers, they're auto-scaled, same system again. We have some varnish in front of them. So, and what they do is if they need to talk to the API again, they make a request, a GraphQL request that goes up here, goes into the ELB again, and goes into the Drupal. That's it. But they have full access to the database. If they want to talk to the database directly, they could. If they want to talk to the Redis container, they could. They're part of the rest of the system. It's nothing different than just another container that is also running there. So that's, from, a, from an uh, infrastructure point of view, the decoupledness is pretty standard. There's nothing special than just running additional containers. Yes? Does GraphQL talk back to Varnish? Yes. So the caching system is quite complex. I could probably just do a session only about that. Um, but yes, we run GraphQL through Varnish. Um, so that means they are actually cached. But we also have a Varnish here. So that means, because we have server-side rendering, so these varnish cache the whole HTML that goes in. If the HTML doesn't exist, the Node.js pre-renders makes GraphQL requests through the Drupal. If the varnish is there as well, the varnish caches it. So you have multiple levels of caching. And um, we use cache tags only, that's a Drupal 8 system. So that's, we use heavily cache tags because all the varnishes do that. In the actual system, there is no single varnish. There's multiple CDNs. So it gets a bit more complicated because now you need to run through the whole thing through CDNs and that stuff. So I'm happy to show you more afterwards if you're interested in that. Um, but yes, we try to cache GraphQL requests because these are obviously um, where the whole computing happens. You, because those GraphQL requests yes. are, are false requests, right? No, they're GET. Sorry? They're GET requests. They're GET requests? Yes. There's another whole session I could do about how you can use GET. <laughs> I show you a code, some about it later. So, okay. And now let's go to the multi -troop, multi front end, and it's the same. Um, so what we have now is just we have that single running in Drupal. That's our Drupal. It's running once, and for every of the front ends that we saw before, we just have that multiple times. And that's all the whole system is. So basically, each site that we saw before has just that individually running, and they all talk to the same Drupal backend. And that's the whole system. And they are auto-scaled, they all are happy, they can be deployed individually here, or all at the same time if necessary, and that's the whole system. That's how we run the big sites. And for the sites that only need one front end, we just run it like that we saw before, where we just have one decoupled site. Yeah? With all this fancy complexity, how do you handle caching validation? I will show you after the session. <laughs> At the end, it's a cache tag. Drupal talks, knows about all the different cache levels, so it talks to three different CDNs. If you save a node, it talks to three different CDNs and says, hey, that cache tag has been changed, and then all the three CDNs say, okay, thank you, I also removed it. That's how it works. That's when Varnish is not involved, right? Yes, I or we talk directly to the Varnish. But I can show you a bit deeper how it works. Okay. Um, yeah. About code stuff. So, usually we run mono repos. Means the decoupled code and the Drupal code is in one single repository. And um, it makes it much easier. Our experience shows 
that sometimes you actually have changes for the front end that also affects the back end or vice versa. If you have that in one Git repository, you always know who is working on what or you see exactly um, what you're doing. It is possible to do it in separate repositories, but our experience shows it's way more complicated. And you will have pull requests and they depend on each other and that branch was deleted and blah, 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 blah. So, um, yes, on the Drupal side though, because it's a stickable site, the signal module that is installed is GraphQL. That's it. Drupal core and GraphQL. And um, nothing more. Um, because all it needs to do is show data. There's no theming involved, there's no other necessary things, um, that's the whole thing. On the front end, um, in our case, it's all React, uh, together with Apollo and Next.js as the underlying server, and we have server-side rendering. That means um, that if a request comes in, the HTML and the CSS is actually rendered on the node container and then sent to the browser. And the browser will, up after that, will only do individual GraphQL requests. I have a whole session about that as well. If you're interested, come to me. I will show you how exactly that works. But with that, you have accessibility solved, not solved, or you have accessibility um, covered because um, for devices that don't have JavaScript, they just get HTML, CSS, the same for crawlers and all that stuff. If you end, we have persistent GraphQL. So what we do is for every GraphQL request that is ever possible, the front end generates a JSON map of every GraphQL um, request that is ever currently possible, and it adds it an ID, and it uploads that JSON to the Drupal. So now, if the front end needs to do a request, instead of sending a huge GraphQL request, it just sends the ID of the GraphQL request to the Drupal. Drupal looks up in the JSON, that it has, it says, oh, that ID maps that GraphQL request, does it internally, and sends it back. And with that, we can do GET requests, because GraphQL works with GET requests, but really fast, GET requests are too long that you can actually do them. And so that's where we use persistent GraphQL. If you're interested, it's all in here. So on Drupal.graphql on GitHub, there is a Drupal decoupled app, and it explains you um, everything about, or it has the back end, the front end, persistent GraphQL, all that stuff is all in there. You can download it, you run four commands, and you have a whole decoupled site running locally um, with everything we just talked about. So, more stuff about code. Um, we can do individual environments. That means everything we saw, so everything, the Nginx, the Varnish, the MySQL, the Redis, the Solar, we can recreate for every single branch or every single pull request. That means if the team builds something and wants to show it to their stakeholders, they create a pull request for that specific code, it sets it up, it configures a Drupal, it imports a database and all that stuff, and they can send one specific link to the stakeholder and they can test their new Christmas feature on the start page or whatever. And we do that for every single thing. And that's what Lagoon does. So Lagoon sees there is a pull request created, it creates an environment, it makes sure that it's there, and it also throws it away if the pull request is deleted. And that's, um, that's where we see multiple teams now working together. Because the different sites that you saw before, they're sometimes handled by different teams. But they all need to test with the same branch, the same Drupal, and that stuff. So, And the cool thing is, when, when an engineer creates a new front-end PR, they can actually define to which back-end in the Drupal they want to point to. So because we have multiple front-ends and one Drupal back-end, um, sometimes they want to create a pull request that points to the production environment. Or they want to create a pull request that loads the data from the staging environment, that stuff. And they can do that with titles, and they can, they can define that themselves. So they can say where, which data should be loaded from. That gives them a lot of flexibility. They can decide. So there's nothing like that they have to change or things like that. And then for the actual testing infrastructure, so unit tests, hat, whatever you want to run, visual regression testing, things like that, that is then ran in Travis and Circle. So Lagoon is not a CI system in terms of it tests your stuff. It's the system that deploys your stuff and creates environments. But if you want to run tests, we run them all in Travis but be or Circle CI. But because they're all dockerized, we can run the same Docker images in the CI system that you also run locally and in production. It's exactly the same system. 
And if you're interested in that, there is an Alex from Australia uh, that works sometimes with us. He created something really cool. It's called DrupalDev.io. And it is a whole system that without you learning how they work, you can run um, PHP code sniffer, ESLint, SASLint, simple test, PHP unit, and BHAT tests in an existing Drupal site on CircleCI. Um, so it's all there. It explains you how it works. It uses our Docker images, um, but you can also deploy into another system if you want. But it shows you how you're going to do all that stuff. It's really cool if you've never done that. It's really hard to get started. That system, um, DrupalDev.io, shows you how you can do it. It is opinionated, but it is something to have a good start. People. First of all, only PR deployments. Like there is never ever somebody pushes into master or any other branch. Like that's not how we're going to do it. It's everything runs via pull requests. Pull requests are approved, pull requests are tested, there's a rigorous testing. Yes, it makes your site slower. Uh, or your development process slower. Yes, there can never be a stakeholder and just come <coughs> just shortly fix that for me. Mm -hmm. It does not exist, but you're going to be happy if you enforce that very strongly. <coughs> then we have PageDB schedules with the developers. So when and when soft sites go down, the first thing that gets informed by PageDB are the developers themselves. They have a rotation because many times they just change something on the site, like they do deployment or they change something that can take the site down or make it slower, which makes, um, which does uh, alerts on our site. And so the developers themselves, they can first, if they say, I have no idea what's happening right now, I need help, then it comes to us as I'm easy, I owe, then the 24 seven people come in and help out. But first it goes to the developers. And I can tell you that changed a lot because in the past, they just did deployments in the afternoon and somehow, like the Maisy team was in a was in a team meeting, and everybody let drop everything because the site was done. So, but now the developers look at it; they say themselves, "Oh, yeah, no, it's good. We just did deployment, or we changed something, or whatever." So that's really cool. The other thing is we have a chat with them together. So if something goes wrong, we have a chat, we have a Slack chat with the client. So we connect the different Slack channels, and we all can talk in there um, together. And um, if something is wrong, we can do that there. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left for learnings. First of all, Node.js as a web server is hard. What do I mean from them? We have a lot of people that come in from Drupal that um, obviously Drupal developers, and they don't really understand that Node.js is now also the web server. Because in Drupal, we have Nginx as the web server and PHP as the FPM system that actually does it. In Node.js, you have both in one. So you can do web server thingies in Node.js, but you also have to do them because there is not a default Nginx con uh, config. If you come to us, uh, to MAZIO, we give you an Nginx um, configuration that does some of the cache headers, redirects, and all that stuff is already done. You have to write the PHP code. If you start from scratch with Node.js, you have to worry about caching. You have to worry about the correct headers and all that stuff as the engineer. And that created sometimes problems and tensions. The solution that the developers came up themselves, they actually added an Nginx container in front of the Node.js container. Within Amaze.io, you can define your own how the infrastructure should look like in a YAML file. So you can say, I want to have an Nginx container, or I want to have a Node container, I want to have a Drupal container, or a PHP container. You can do that all yourself. You can test it locally, and then they did themselves. So they solved some of the problems, completed themselves, and suddenly, at one point, I saw an Nginx container in front of the Node.js. I was like, okay, they had a problem, they solved it, um, really nice. But yeah, we had some discussions with engineers that they said, like, but the hosting infrastructure should care, care about the headers. And I'm like, well, yes, in a Node.js environment, it's a bit different. Next, persistent GraphQL. Um, yes, um, we do have, though, that in PR and dev environments, we do allow post uh, GraphQL queries because they're much easier to handle and you don't have to like do the JSON uh, map and upload it to Drupal and all that type of stuff. But make sure that you have tests for them. We had cases where people deployed something without uploading the JSON file and it, it went really funny because somehow the website was down and nobody knew why and yeah, it was a bit of debugging. So make sure that you understand the complexity of adding that. Next, complexity as a service. <laughs> Yes, 
the CDN. I did not include it here because it is quite, quite complex. Um, make sure it's documented well. Make sure that, every, that, that more than just a couple of people understand how it works. Because CDN certainly is a system that you don't have control over. What is really cool about that system, everybody can look into every configuration. First of all, it's completely open source, but also everybody has access to every Nginx, every Node.js, and every PHP configuration. But now with CDNs, you suddenly don't have. So make sure that you ha if you depend on the CDN, that you have a phone number that you can call 24 seven if you have a problem. We had issues with the CDN that we were not sure if the CDN is actually the problem or not. Because, but we, because we don't have access to the configuration, we were never sure. And we didn't have access to 24 hour support from them side, so it was quite hard. It created a lot of pain, a lot of like organization, like okay, is it a problem or not? Blah, blah, blah. So make sure that you have, to have access to the people and resources of your external services, if you depend on them, or build it in a way that you don't need them at all. Next, crisis communication. <laughs> Whenever at AmazeIO there is an, an incident that has to do with, um, that is a bit bigger, we, dis we dedicate one engineer to communication only. So uh, when there is a problem, one person is only responsible for the communication while the other one are handling the actual incident. That's super important because the people that should solve the problem should not be the people that, that listen to yelling clients. And the person that listens to yelling clients should not be the person that also tries to solve the issue. So we clearly defined sh design sh shortly who is doing what. I'm doing communications, they create a status page, they go into Slack channels, they inform everybody, and the other people are actually solving the problem. If you try to do that above, it will go fail. And then just the chat and the chat box helps tremendous. All the, on the client side, all the people that if something goes wrong, they come into the Slack channel and they see that we are talking about it already. And that reduces the risk, the anxiety of them a lot. And because they see they're working on it. And before we had that, they sent emails, they called, blah. It's just, and we spend more time explaining people that we're working on it than actually fixing the problem. And the other thing is we do, we have now internal status pages for the stakeholders. So we have status pages where we can put up. It's only read by five, 10 people, maybe, max. But these five, 10 people are five or 10 less phone calls that you have to handle. So that makes a lot of things much easier. That's it. Are there any questions? <laughs> questions? Have you looked into MySQL 8? We run MariaDB. <laughs> no. Why? Why should we? I don't know. They say that they have very good performance. Yeah, sorry, the company behind is not. <laughs> yeah, no, we... I mean, we fell in love with Galera, to be very honest. You can run it on MySQL, it's much harder. So we just run it on MariaDB with Galera, it works perfectly. You can kill nodes, they come back, they synchronize themselves, you can add more, you can remove them. It's just so nice and that, yeah, there is no need right now to move away. And I believe if, 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 they, if it's really that good, as they claim, then it's probably going to be happening in the other, in the forks anyway. So. All right, the session is online. We're going to post it on Twitter, on the Maze.io. It's going to be on Batcamp. If you have any more questions, ask. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.